All right, hello and welcome to day 164, 365 days towards racial change. My name is Tom Lins Nyback. Thank you for hanging in there. Well, we've got a lot to get to today. We're going to have story time. I like story time a lot. <laughs> well, then we're going to have some meat. Whole uh, room full of children, my own, <laughs> to share my experience, travels, and these adventures here. Uh, first, let's talk about why we're here, talking about black issues in America. Uh, as I see it, I'm only one, you know, of a few million of us, a small percentage of the population. And um, the articulating my issues and the work is not um, original by any means. Uh, but but I find I found some resources that help me explain my experience, my perspective in America. You know, I, I get feedback to on various levels from get over it <laughs> to uh, uh, we totally understand how you're feeling uh, to utter silence. It's okay. This is this is my own personal project and. Uh, I thank you for following along. Uh, two big thoughts emerge. Here we go as I continue to project. Number one is for the mind of America that has two uh, veins, if you will. First thought is uh, for the black mind. Does the black mind, is the black mind still trapped, entrenched? Has it ever recovered? from hundreds of years of conditioning through slavery in America. Uh, so we could, I think that's a discussion that can go on, be a lengthy discussion. <clears throat> Second side of that same coin about the mind of America is for white privilege, white status, uh, how whites get along, move in and out freely, not just in this nation, but in the world at large. It's um, that's another lengthy discussion. But, you know, we got a year to tease out a whole lot of angles on this. Second um, big thought that's come about my burden for financial literacy. I'm seeing these commercials on CNN. A little young black man has started a clothing line and a company. And he's, he's probably, he must be doing extremely well if he's being, if he's gotten money to do advertisements on CNN, apparently uh, from Philly, and I'm pretty well acquainted with that town. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, you know, it's interesting, I, I kind of, I'm talking him up a little bit today in, in regards to financial literacy, because in the commercial, he talks about being mentored on taxes, financial literacy, you know, all these uh, investments and things like that. And that is what I'm talking about. You know, we, we get our language, our ideas together, you know, around uh, some truth uh, properly situated. And then we can excel in the discipline, in the area that we are uh, working on. So important. So I'm giving a shout. I forget the name of the clothing line. I don't want to make a mistake with that, but uh, I'm glad. I'm happy for him. And it's, it's a definitely a result of what I've been saying about financial literacy. I'm moving in that direction. I'm glad he caught fire. He, I don't even know if he's even out of, he's in his early teens, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, you know, yeah, I hope he appreciates being surrounded by some knowledgeable people uh, to, to help him elevate his, you know, his way is paved, you know, as long as he keeps his head. I think he will. Uh, okay, um, I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I've read three of his works. If you get any of his works, get this one and absorb it. Mine's all marked up and everything. It's starting to get worn out. That's a good sign. 
you know that that's how you want your Bible to look right your you know whatever your primary resources or resources are they should be all marked up they shouldn't be in pristine condition and whatnot uh, I'm a guitar player I, I had a guitar uh, for my my first guitar serious guitar I had it customized and all that I played it so long that the metal frets had were worn out <laughs> from playing it a black history reader 101 questions you never thought to ask get that uh, get all these but if you get one get that black labor white wealth search for power and economic justice and dr. Anderson's national plan to empower black America powernomics you can find dr. Anderson at powernomics.com and the Heritage Institute in Washington DC uh, behind me you see the hashtag us to symbol find black women supporting one another there check out black enough b-l-a-g-g-e-n-u-f uh, this is the web World Wide web so therefore if you found me here oh then you can find your flavor your passion your people uh, anywhere it's the internet and every iteration of human thought that's billions of thought are available here if you're still struggling to find your voice do what I did start your own and let's we'll see what happens I got a handful of private email subscribers and I see feedback there on videos every once in a while and uh, well, let's have it let's go for it <laughs> okay uh, and finally like I said today is story time but I, I uh, encourage people with this resource anyway Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, fictional account of slave life in America and uh, white life I think it it rounds out our discussion real nicely because uh, it, it kind of it, it gives us some illustrations of some some of the possible dynamics between um, slaves and their masters all right we're uh, day 164 here in our year-long trek uh, chapter 17 it was going to be an OT part remember we're, we're slowing down a little bit in the text got a long way to go uh, get the book yourself <laughs> chapter 17 there's 40 chapters so we got a little ways to go here but I'm just slowing down uh, to look now we've got some foundation uh, from previous chapters so we're going to slow down a little bit and uh, see what Harriet Beecher Stowe is telling us uh, through the text here I uh, want to leave off remember we left Tom and Eva in the garden and they're having fellowship Tom is Eva's personal attendant and all that so that, that was some good chunk of story now Harriet Beecher Stowe kind of flips the script a little bit and we talk we go back to Eliza little Harry and George remember them they have escaped from their Kentucky um, enslavement and going north. Tom was in the same area, a friend of Eliza, on the, they were on the same plantation, but Tom was sold south. He stayed obedient and submissive, and he is now in New Orleans. <clears throat> Eliza, Harry, and George are headed north, and they have uh, been befriended by Quakers Quakers noted as well they're pacifists and uh, abolitionists you know they they um, recognize the humanity of individuals and do not participate in slave trades and weirdness things like that they are totally um, uh, sold out for seeing that all men and women live uh, freely that I mean that's the Quaker way there it's not derived or anything they're not a uh, special kind of uh, you know, outliers of their religion they 
all the Quakers are like this. Uh, they're, uh, Tom, uh, Eliza, Harry, and George are at the Quaker house. They're eating. They're already kind of preparing uh, to make them their another move during the evening, but news reaches them that they are um, being now hunted and their, their trail is, is fresh to a band of uh, hunters after them there. So they, the, the Quakers, Tom Eliza, I mean, George Eliza and Harry have to pick up uh, their pace a little bit. Uh, constables have been, been hired to augment the band. And, you know, the constable is just, oh, that's a lot more legal uh, validation uh, for this engagement. The, um, you know, the slave hunters have, you know, kind of every right to, uh, well, in America, every right to go after their this property, the runaway slaves, constables are there uh, to kind of up the ante. Uh, a new, more level of force can be used. Uh, not as though it makes much difference <laughs> how that gets played out um, because uh, the white establishment, the institution uh, had full, had no boundaries anyway, constables or not. Uh, so they're they're hard on the path, and they're they have stopped in a village not far from the house, served up brandy all around, and now have a good little bunch of uh, guys with guns on horses, uh, little <laughs> kind of drunk and going after. The party. Um, George, he's reflecting on his sister that um, he has, he saw her get sold, his, his sister and mother get sold in a New, New Orleans market. And uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe re revisits, oh, the issue of family in. Um, in the text and how, how the, so many black families are separated and whatnot and the, the damage it does uh, ju just to generations of individuals and um, uh, so that uh, George is reflecting on this whole thing and this is one of George's motivations for uh, being so uh, so adamant, protective, you know, these Quakers, these pacifists, half pistols, uh, you, you, you gotta be, you gotta arm yourself. So I'm not gonna go into that, right? Make any jokes about that. But George is ready to use uh, their weapons in defense of his family. He's ready to lay down his life. Uh, he feels as though he's tasted freedom and he's going to hold on to that. I'm in a similar experience myself. I'm in a, a, a two-year reprieve of battles and confusions and whatnot. And now, now that I've kind of tasted, uh, I had finally had some elbow room. Uh, I'm much more motivated to hold on to that. And I'm much more motivated uh, not... Uh, to um, hinder myself as I've done in the past. I've sabotaged myself in ruinous ways and it takes so, so long to recover uh, from those kind of experiences. So, so I get uh, what George is feeling and how he feels uh, about tasting some freedom. And that's what everybody wants. Once you give somebody some liberty, uh, it's hard to break them. It's like you got an inside cat, a little pet cat. You let it run around inside, uh, but once don't give it a taste of outside if you want it to be happy. <laughs> once, 
once it gets a taste of outside, it's going to be it's going to be a problem. You know, I had that with my little sister years ago. So we got cats and she's on letting the cat sniff at the door and be around. And I was like, don't do that. Sure enough, she does it. Cats run free. And, and cats, I mean, they're smart. They know where home is and all that. But it was eventually a problem. And my mother got rid of the cats, you know. Uh, when I get cats, they're on. Um, they stay inside. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe gets into some scripture. Uh, she gets into Psalm seventy-three because the Quakers are trying to bring George off of the ledge of violence. You know, they don't. The Quakers are ready for violence. They will engage. But that, that they they're trying to you know, get George in the space where it's the last resort. Okay, George, we know you're hyped up, you're ready to defend your family, and all this. We get it, but let, let's make that the last resort, George. We don't want that to be the norm <laughs> by any means. Um, so they they remind them of some scripture. They kind of talk them off the ledge. Uh, Psalm 73, verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And there's a little bit of discussion in there about this Christian nation having slaves, being mistreated, and all that. And uh, George says, yes, that's how I feel. And George knows some scripture as well. But he's like, he agrees with the Quakers uh, on that point. You know, and this is... Um, uh, this is the crux of it. You know, and we, we struggle with this in our own life, you know. Uh, and why, how come everybody is it, you know. You, you see, uh, just recently, uh, it's um, June 13th, uh, Ortiz, the uh, great, I think, Red Sox player, Boston Red Sox player, uh, apparently had a contract on his life that he didn't know it and he was shot in the back you know and we see so much wickedness in the world and yet those uh, with uh, questionable motives and things like that they kind of go on and appear they appear to prosper and it goes on in uh, Psalm 73 verse 17 the psalmist says until he Psalms is meditating on this dichotomy. He says, you know, I, I was confused and whatnot until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. And I'll tell you what, almost daily, uh, because the news is so riddled with unrest and violence and all that, and, and I have to refocus my courage just to leave the house Sometimes, because you just don't know where it's coming from <laughs> at times, and the the violence of the world, and so I have to encourage myself at the ultimate end. You know, I I I, I don't know what a person does who doesn't have a god or any any sense of relationship. Um about after this life nobody gets out alive you know uh, so daily I'm even, I even find myself uh, encouraging myself just on the point like no matter what happens the configuration orientation of my life there is I have an expectation that um, has a lot of great good points after I shake off this mortal coil. <laughs> uh, so they, they load up, they're ready to go. Uh, they know they're being chased and hunted, but it, it, at 3 a.m. they're rattling along on the wagon, uh, kind of in the dark, and uh, they hear hoofs 
uh, hoofbeats coming up behind him. It's actually an ally. To, he's ridden ahead of the constable and the band that has left the village, has served up Brandy, and now has a pretty good-sized posse after them. Uh, so they quicken their pace and all that. The, the driver is a Quaker, well acquainted with the land, and he stops out of space. Uh, with, I guess there's rocks, so it's elevated. So they they stop there and they climb up, uh, trying to get escape. But it's not not very good because it's defendable. You know, it's got it's got a pinch point. Uh, if you're familiar with the uh, the movie 300, you know, it's how those uh, Spartans held off an entire, you know, millions of people uh, because they took that small group of guys and they had, uh, you know, have sheer walls, cliffs on each side of them, you know, so they had that choke point, you know, so the enemy has to kind of come in like, um, you know, in smaller numbers, and that's manageable. You can hold off uh, many more you know, people than being spread out on a big battlefield. Um, so it's a it's a defendable spot, but they're trapped in this elevated position. Uh, in the brief notes, I, I put some commentary on a, a, a uh, situation called cooning. Um, where, uh, and this was cooning, you'll see the reason like they call it cooning, uh, because one of the, um, one of these, uh, slave hunters refers to the coons up there is because they would, uh, you know, for sport, it was, uh, customary at times, uh, to let slaves run off for their lives be tracked by dogs and whatnot, and of course the the dogs would outrun the slave, and the slave would find a tree, run, get up the tree, and uh, that was coon. They were cooned up there, and then they'd be shot down. And what uh, you know, it refers to like if they're trapping raccoons or other uh, maybe small beasts. Out in the forest, that's what that's how they do it. That these dogs don't climb trees; they just, you know, chase you up there, and, and the hunter comes up, easy prey, and shoots him down. And that's what they did with slaves. Um, with some slaves, I think there was a famous Florida case uh, that Dr. Anderson comments on, where some reparations were made uh, to families who had victims. Uh, of this sport. Uh, if you remember the name Tom Loker, he was uh, one of these uh, hunters and and whatnot. You know, he's um, <laughs> you know he, he's not been outsmarted by a black man or anything like that, and so he gathers his courage and he heads on up the cliff. Um, some shooting has gone on because George has stood out and been defiant uh, about uh, about them taking him back and George declares his freedom over that. You know, much like, it's not much different from what the colonists did in shaking their fist at England. You know, the colonists were you know, in a, in a space, a, a defendable space, and came out and declared their independence and whatnot, you know, and it's interesting to see that, that, that parallel, how they defended, declared their freedom, but then took it away uh, from a whole group of people just based on skin color alone. Very, very uh, demonic, the satanic, uh, what the colonists did. I won't go into that. We, we talk about that pretty consistently uh, throughout the year we brought that up.
anytime we talk about history, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, that illustration must come forward and be fresh in our minds. The hypocrisy of um, the white institution, European institution in America, still alive today. Uh, so Tom Loker gathers his bravery, comes on up as he pokes his head uh, over this, um, you know, up this, uh, I guess, embankment, which is kind of is, uh, separated by a small chasm. It's, it's up, it's elevated a ways. And uh, we finish uh, part one with George firing a shot. I love cliffhangers. I, I'm doing some, uh, taking some license <laughs> with the narrative. So since you don't have the book, we don't know what happened when George fired his shot after George, after he sees Tom's, Tom Loker's head come up over, uh, you know, over that space, you know, Tom is visible, George fires, we'll find out tomorrow what happens. But, you know, a lot of few things in the first half of that chapter, you know, uh, more appearance of scripture, uh, understanding Quakers as allies, um, Cooning, remember Cooning, we're going to, um, that, that's actually in one of Dr. Anderson's uh, resources there, so we're going to talk about that as well, because uh, I don't think we talked about it specifically, yeah, we've gone over so much material after 164 days here but uh, well, I'm enjoying the journey please stick around um, uh, well I won't give you the details breakdown of my life but things are really getting busy I uh, hope to see my mother uh, in August <laughs> in a couple days and I'm trying to figure out the logistics of keeping this going um, and whatnot, but uh, we, we'll just cross those bridges together as we continue. I'm Tomlin's Nyback. That's day 164 out of the way of 365 days towards racial change. I'll see you tomorrow. Let's see what happens there. Uh, there's gunshots and firings and stuff like that. Bye-bye. <laughs>